All right, while well, uh, the presentation is being loaded, I'm going to start introducing myself maybe. Um, so bad news, I'm speaking English, but I could be speaking French. Could be worse, right? Uh, so I come from Paris, I'm an I lady, I work for GitHub. So I always enjoy coming in, uh, in Madrid, uh, enjoying the nightlife, meaning I'm trying to sleep in bed and hearing the nightlife outside. Uh, it's always fun. So I'm going to speak a little bit about, uh, I guess you've seen that I was uh, mentioned twice in the agenda, so both for culture and uh, for DevOps. And I think it's, uh, it, it's great to see that um, DevOps goes with uh, culture. I mean, it's not just a technical problem, it's a cultural problem first and foremost. Uh, and I'll go beyond that. It's, it's a most, more than, uh, also next to culture, something that we um, very often forget is uh, DevOps is also an application design problem. You know, it's uh, the more you think about DevOps when building your app, the best uh, results you would get. There was a, an analogy in a book I was reading a couple, couple of days ago about um, automotive. You know, uh, in the 80s, people started looking at what Toyota was doing, and they realized that Toyota was not just designing a car and then thinking about how to build it. They were thinking about the function and design of the car and the, the design of the building process at the same time. So that's really what we should be start doing when designing new application. We need to build features, but also build the way we're going to release it. And you will see a couple examples in my presentation on how we're doing that at GitHub. Um, and I need to figure that one. All right, so GitHub. Um, everybody has already heard about GitHub, right? We sell t-shirts and stickers. Uh, we do a little bit of software as well. Um, we uh, the first commit on the GitHub project happened two weeks ago, uh, ten years ago, two weeks ago. Uh, that's uh, the exact uh, anniversary of that. The company is nine years old, so the company was uh, funded later. And um, this is a picture of an internal application that we have, where we see everybody uh, in the company. So you see, we have people all over the world. We have 713 people. That, that was uh, two days ago. Um, and we have people all over the planet. So you see, uh, we have somebody here in Iceland. Um, usually we have somebody here in Hawaii, but that person must be traveling somewhere at the moment. We have people all over there. I just cannot find it with the pointer. Uh, in New Zealand. So we, have, we, have, we are a very distributed company, and that's by design. You know, from, from day one, we had people all over the planet already. Um, all these people have to work together. I mean, a team, uh, a, a given software team, like a team of six or seven people working on a specific topic in the application, might be distributed too. You might have somebody in Seattle, somebody in, in, in Amsterdam, and somebody in New Zealand. They have to work together, right? Um, that's not common, right? Usually, you know, you have a wall with some stickers and you can, you know, plan your software and, and work together and talk, but we cannot do that. We can't have a big enough wall to put stickers on them so people can see them all together. Um, so very quickly, we realized that we need to find different ways of working. Um, we need to organize ourselves so this can work and this can scale, and we can deliver our software often. When I'm talking about delivering software often, um, this is a graph of the number of deployment on github.com production systems of github.com in a given week. That was back in May, but it's a very typical week. 440 production release in one week. That's about 80 deployment a day in the production environment. Um, just so you know, GitHub is between the 50th and 60th website on the planet. So, you know, between 50 and 60, that's our, uh, our ranking, you know, based on um, fluctuations or, or during the year. That's about 50 million uh, monthly users. Uh, that's a lot of traffic. And yet, we're deploying 80 times a day. And what we sometimes have a couple issues, but most of the time you don't even see it, right? It's totally uh, seamless for you. Does, has anybody uh, deploying at least 10 times a day here? 10 times a week? 10 times a month? Oh, come on. Ah, oh, no, you're kidding me, you have to. Um, all right, so that's a lot of deployment, I guess. Um, so 
what's our secret? Well, it won't be a secret anymore because I'm going to share it with you. Um, so we got a couple of things. So first of all, surprise, we're using GitHub. Uh, we're using it a lot and for all kind of different things. Um, fun fact is everybody at GitHub uses GitHub. So the lawyers, marketing people, um, the salespeople, there is not a single function at GitHub that's not using GitHub, right? Even the janitor, even the guy who is refilling the bar is using GitHub. Like you want a whiskey, you open a pull request, say this is a whiskey I want, and the guy will deliver. Uh, everybody is using GitHub. To the point where we basically don't use email much. We don't write emails, we receive emails, uh, we receive notifications, GitHub notifications for emails, but I'm not going to write an email to Carmen, who is here. Um, I, I'm going to go to a repo, write an issue, and say, hey guys, or girls, or whoever, or Carmen, uh, uh, we should do that and that and that. All right. So there is a repo for salespeople, there is a repo for marketing people, there is a repo for the uh, Spanish team, right? You have your own repo. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so there is a repo for everything, and we use the repos as a kind of forum, basically. So we, we use issues, um, and we write in the public. So by default, everybody, everything is open, and, and that's where we communicate with people. Uh, and think about it. I mean, it's so much better than emails. Well, first of all, an email, that's, you know, you put an information in an email, six months later, it's gone. Like, nobody knows anymore where it is. Like, I, get, I think we talked about that, but I cannot think cannot find it anymore. You have no idea where it goes. Um, and on, on, on an issue, you can, oops, wrong button, go back. Um, you can have some, where, yeah, you can put some tags, uh, you can put some assignees, you can cross-reference things. Uh, we don't have any cross-reference, yes, over there. No, we don't. Uh, you can add mention people. You can do a lot more than what you get in an email. Right? It's a lot richer, and it's searchable, it's discoverable, and it's open to everybody. So people can jump in the conversation. You had no idea that person had some expertise on that topic. Uh, she just happened to discover the discussion and chime in and say, hey, I got an idea, let's do that and that. With emails, you restrict yourself to a list of given people that you think might have an opinion on something. So you, you lose opportunities to, to broaden the conversation. So it's so much, so much more efficient at the end of the day. Um, well, of course, we can uh, you know, put these issues now in boards and organize them if they are here to track ideas or, or um, projects or whatever. Um, that's a great way also of enhancing the conversation with that. The next thing we use a lot uh, is pull requests. So we use them for everything again, because in our marketing repo or in our uh, legal repo, we don't have code, right? We don't have Java, we don't have JavaScript, we don't have uh, uh, Ruby, uh, but we have markdown documents. It's still sort of code for us, uh, and we still have collaboration on that. So we still have code review on markdown documents, and it could be a legal contract, but we still do code review on that. It's, it's quite interesting to do that. Um, but let's put that in the context of um, software development. The pull request, um, the pull request is, is such a great thing. It's, it's really what um, I think um, gave the opportunity for the world to start collaborating on open source. Right, pull, uh, before pull request, remember, like if we go back 10 years ago, what was the open source world like? There was the Apache Foundation, there was the Eclipse Foundation, there was the Mozilla Foundation, you get a couple of foundations, right? Um, there was SourceForge, but I mean, the, the number of open source projects was probably in the thousands, being generous, being, it was in the thousands. Um, and th there was actually some guy who uh, tracked the, the, the contribution to the Ruby uh, language uh, before and after uh, being on GitHub. There's just an explosion of the contribution because the pull request just lowered the barrier to entry for contributors. It became so much easier for contribution to happen because of that, because before that, you had the concept of untrusted committer. You were not trusted. Uh, and so being untrusted, you had no consideration or not much consideration for the, from the project leaders because also it was taking time for them to look at your contribution and to start you know, checking the code and you know, integrating that and doing code review and, and everything. So with that, it became so much easier to do that. 
Um, so nowadays, the pull request is, is widely used, and when we talk not about the open source world, but the, the corporate world, people use that as a way to do code review, right? You, are you all doing code reviews? More or less? The people are like, yeah, I know I should, but I don't. Well, you should. Uh, it's, it's a great way to enhance um, the quality of your project. There will be immediate results on that. So it's not a waste of time, you know, like, Five years ago, 10 years ago, people were still doubtful about testing. Like, should I test? Oh, it's an investment. Maybe I won't do that. Nowadays, people are very convinced of that most of the time. If you're not, you should leave the room. Uh, but it's the same thing for code review. It's, it's such a great enhancement of quality. But there are also benefits of that. Um, when, you, when you're doing a code review, you're learning from other people. So it's a great learning opportunity at the same time. You learn new techniques. Or you learn your code base as well, so you, you, you are more aware of everything that goes into your application. It's a great way to also harmonize uh, the way the software is being developed in the company. So there are so many benefits, but I, I don't have time to go all over, the, uh, over all of them. The one thing also that I would like to leave you with um, is when to open a pull request. Most of the time, people are thinking that pull request equals code review, so I'm going to code, and at the end, I'm going to open a pull request and, and ask for a code review for my peers. Because that's what we've been doing in the open source world, and it, it makes sense over there. You're not going to uh, ask the maintainers to look at your, code, uh, at your code before actually doing the code. But in, in a company, when we are working in a project in a very close way, there are a better way of doing that, because the context is different, of course. What we do at GitHub is we create like one commit, tiny one, like the smallest one possible, and very quickly we open the pull request. And we open the pull request to say, hey team, here's what I want to do, here's why I want to do that, and here's how I'm going to do that. Do you agree on that? Do we have the same views on what I'm going to achieve over there? And we start the discussion there, and we get feedback from people. So you see uh, over there, that person tries to explain. This is a short one, uh, but so very often the explanation is a lot bigger. And then it always finishes by, hey, CC, and this is a team I want to have opinion for. Right? So it's so much better to have an agreement before starting working, because think about it. You start coding, and at the end, people are saying, no, you get it wrong. You should not have done that, or you should have done it off, uh, differently. And then the code review process becomes harder, right? The discussion is harder. It's, uh, you, you start uh, having hard feelings because you involve yourself in developing that. You spend some time, and now you have to go back and say, hey, I have to change that. I don't want to change that, right? <laughs> Even though I'm, seeing, I'm thinking like, yeah, it's probably right, but I don't want to do that. It's hard, you know? Uh, so, but if you have the conversation before, you're like, okay, yeah, good idea, I'll do it that way. And that's no brainer then. Um, so I really encourage you to do that. This, the other benefit also is that people who are going to provide a code review to you, it will be so much faster for them because they know exactly what to expect, right? They're not going to discover things and start screaming. Uh, they were like, yep, 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 okay. I agree with that. Okay, so it, it makes everybody's life uh, a lot a lot easier, and you really get valuable code review from that. So we, we focus on, on what's important and not the rest. So just start doing that, and you'll see quality will be so much higher, and again, great learning opportunity over there for everybody, for the people who are being reviewed, but for the reviewer as well. Everybody benefits from that. So um, there, there are some, some debates also, as like, should we have one person doing code review for the for everybody, or like everybody should do code review for everybody. Uh, the later, the later is better. Like code review, everybody, everybody does that. Uh, it's so much better. All right. Well, so in the code review, we have a lot of people jumping in uh, or in the pull request. We have a lot of people being involved and in changing with each other. We also have feedbacks from tools. Tools are bringing back information to uh, to the pull request, so the developer is informed about what's going on, and is informed right in the pull request. We don't need to go in different systems to get information back about what's going on. We centralize information back in the pull request. So that's what we got here. This is from uh, one of our pull requests, one of the pull requests where we're developing GitHub. We have 21 pieces of information back from our CI systems. 
21 information back. I just, I don't just have like Jenkins telling me everything is good or something is bad. Because something is bad is not a good information. I need to go deeper. I need to go in another tool looking for that stuff. And I might realize that, oh, this is this just small integration we have. I mean, I don't care, right? Because if I'm starting doing that and saying, oh, I don't care about that one, next time I'm going to push, maybe it's going to be red. Oh, it's probably that stuff. I'm not going to even check and see what's going on. You know, I'm just going to assume. And then you lower the quality, and then your CI is becoming useless. So we decided that CI should bring us back as many information as possible. So it's in the face of the developer. He knows or she knows what's going on. And on top of that, you see, we can decide what is required and what's not. So it's not longer the developer who is deciding on what's required or not. That's a team who is deciding what's required or not. So we, we've basically hard-coded what's the minimum level of quality we want for a developer to ship something. It's quite, it's quite good also to be expressive that way. All right, so we got this information. Um, we also got information about deployments. Still, going back to the pull request. I mean, that's the key. Everything goes back to the pull request. So I have the life cycle of my feature going back to my pull request, so I always know everything that has happened. So CI, CD, every tool send back information to my pull request so I know exactly what's going on. And if my team wants to see what I'm working on, well, they can click on view deployment and they go to my um, test application deployed somewhere. I don't care where it is. I don't need to know the, the, the link to that. Just click on that button and I get the information. All that stuff you can do it today, you know? It's, it's feature available on GitHub, so just do it. Um, all right, so let's summarize that, the way we're working. That's called the GitHub flow, by the way. Um, so we open a feature branch. There's a lot of debates about feature branches versus trunk-based development. I don't know if you read stuff about that. Uh, a feature branch for us is something that leaves for like a couple of days max, right? It's not like that six-month feature branch that people are talking to you about. Uh, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Uh, so we create a feature branch. We start committing on that, but very quickly we open the pull request, we discuss, we do reviews, and then we ship the branch. We ship the branch in test environments, QA environments, whatever environments you can think of. But we ship also that branch um, in production. At GitHub, we've decided that the only way for us to validate that a feature is ready for production is to push it in production. So you push it first, you look how it goes, and then you decide to eventually merge with master. See, the merge is after. Um, right? It's interesting, right? Everybody is doing that? No? Uh, all right. Uh, so, it's, it's some, some concept very interesting. So, again, uh, we are the 50th, 60th website on the planet, millions of visitors, several servers to achieve that, several hundred servers, almost 1,000 servers, maybe more, to achieve that. So, um, how do we ensure that it's doable, right? Because Deploying 80 times an application on such massive scale requires some kind of automation, to say the least. All right? And for us to do that, and to do that with a distributed team again, you know, there is no way of saying, hey guys, I'm going to deploy something. You know, people might be sleeping in New Zealand, uh, people might not be at the office because most of the time we're not in the office. So we need to have a solid way to both automate that, but also to ensure transparency on what's going on in our system. So in order to achieve that, we created a robot. It's called Ubot. It's an open source project, so you can you know you can use it. Uh, it's based on Node.js. You can create your own scripts, um, and it's uh, it's what we call a chat robot. So you know it's not these chatbots that we hear about that starts conversation and think uh, make you think that are they are human. It's just a robot that's connecting to your chat. It's a new person in your chat room. So it could be Slack. It could be some other tools as well. And uh, you're going to use it as a way to get access to your production system or to whatever system you have. And when I'm talking whatever system, about whatever system you have, well, we have some quite creativity at GitHub for that. Well, first of all, we, we love you but so much that we have videos about that. So you can check our, actually, your YouTube, our YouTube channel, so uh, youtube.com slash GitHub, and you will see uh, videos about that. Um, so we, are, we get animation as 
As a matter of fact, we have full-time employees who are paid to do animations and, and movies. Uh, again, we are a t-shirt company so and stickers. Um, we do massive, giant U-Bot sculpture with balloons. Uh, we uh, use it for fun things. So if I want to uh, find a map to go to the stadium, I can go to Slack and say, U-Bot, map me Bernabeu, or give me an image of Zidane. Uh, by the way, it's French, right? All right yeah. Um, and we can find the, the, the food trucks ne next to the office as well. So U-Bot does all kind of things for us. Ubot has access to all our applications, and we've created scripts basically to interface all our applications for Ubot. Salesforce, Splunk, um, um, our monitoring infrastructure like Graphite. Uh, we're, not, we're not using Graphite anymore, we use Datadog and some other things. But all these graphs are accessed for Ubot as well. So I don't need to have access to all these systems. Ubot has access and provides that to me. And I usually access that in a chat room, so it's in the face of my colleagues as well, so we can start discussing that right away. You know, I, I, I don't need to send them a link so they can check for themselves, and maybe they don't see the same thing. No, we know we're saying we're watching the same thing. All right, um, so Ubot does more interesting things as well, so more directly useful things. Um, Ubot observes what's going on in my repos or in my team's repos, so it's going to comment whenever uh, somebody's pushing code or creating a new pull request, something, Ubot is going to warn me in Slack as well, so I know what's going on. Um, the other way around, if in Slack I'm discussing about an issue with a colleague, Ubot is going to create a link in that issue, so there's a, 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 yeah, there's a link that's kept forever between the conversation in Slack and the issue itself. So I can say, oh, these people, these two guys start discussing that. Interesting, what, what happened? You know, it's, it's, it's saved in Slack, so I can always look, look that up. Um, but then comes the interesting uh, part. Um, I want to deploy software. I want to deploy my code to some infrastructure. So I'm going to go in a specific room. There is a, a chat ops. That's why we call uh, our, our usage of uh, U-Bots, called chat ops. We have a, a chat ops room where a developer can come, and if he's new uh, to GitHub, uh, he can explore what's going on. So he, say, he can type a comment. So every time you see uh, we're using comment for Ubot, it starts with dot. So um, that's a, a Ubot command. And it's typing WCID means uh, where can I deploy. And Ubot will list all the environments that is aware of. So we got a bunch of environments here. Um, some are physical, some are virtual. So the physical ones have the concept of being locked or unlocked. Uh, this one is locked. Um, so they're physical, so only one developer can test or can use them at a time. Uh, the virtual one uh, that you got here, it's always available, meaning that we're going to provision on the fly some virtual environment. So as long as there's enough capacity, we can provision new ones, it doesn't matter. So the developer can decide on um, probably deploying into one test environment. Usually the workflow is like, I'm going to use a test environment, check it works, then deploy to production slash canary, so a subset of production. And if I'm happy with what's going on, I'm going to deploy with production. So I've skipped a couple of uh, steps over there. But what's going to happen is that the developer uh, who wants to go to production, which is a physical environment, so there is a queue for that, because no, we can't accept two developers to test in the production environment at the same time. It's going to be, it, it would be messy otherwise. So the developer will check the status of the queue. Um, if he's okay with the status of the queue, it will go into the queue. So QMTD means over there, queue me to deploy, and you give the reference of your uh, pull request or branch, and you both would say, okay, you're in the queue, this is the status of the queue, um, I'll ping you whenever it's your turn, right? And a um, couple of minutes later, uh, usually a, a, a production testing, it's between like 10 to 20 minutes, you know, to give you an idea of how long it takes. We have quite a lot of traffic, so you don't need to wait a lot of time to see if there are new exceptions or new errors or new things like this, so we get that benefit. Um, so a couple of minutes later, the developer uh, will go over there and say, I want to deploy my uh, branch to production. So dot deploy my branch to prod. That's the only action required by the developer 
to deploy something on thousands of servers. Right? The rest is fully automated. The developer cannot mess that up. There is no way in hell they can mess that up. You can be an employee for GitHub since 10 minutes. It, you won't be able to mess up anything, right? So that's the key. That's the key. It has to be that simple for it to work. Um, and you see, um, that was required at 2 or 2 p.m. Five minutes later, Ubot gets back and say it's done, right? So we have deployed in that process, upgrade out the uh, the exact number of servers. It's in the range of 600 to 800 servers impacted over there. Okay, um, so it's pretty cool, right? Uh, um, there's a yeah. Just so you know, so there is a, a reference here uh, to the developer uh, about Haystack and GraphMe. that are two applications that we have. We do have a team at GitHub in charge of you know network operations, monitoring, uh, all that stuff, right? They are monitoring 24/7 what's going on. But as we as we let the developer deploy in production and testing in production, it means the developer needs to be looking at what's going on. So we created an app for that called Haystack. And in Haystack, we are looking for needles. Um, so the developer, uh, we need to go right away to the application. And with that, it will see everything that's going on over there. So he, he, he needs or she needs to look at that for the next 10 to 20 minutes in order to make sure that there is no side effects of the code that's just been deployed. Right? So they have full access to all the monitoring infrastructure and to all the logs that we have. And we made that simple for that application. And on top of there, like you see a timeline here. It's about it's about three hours, if I remember correctly, uh, from 2:45 a.m. Uh, p.m. to 5:45 p.m. And you see the picture of all the people who have deployed something. So each picture is a deployment. And if you click on the picture, you can have a link directly to the pull request, and you have filter all the exceptions. So if you see an exception, a, a rate of exception uh, bigger than usually in a time range after a deployment, you click on the pull request button, you go directly to the code that has been deployed there. And that's a code of one pull request. That's not two months worth of code being deployed at the same time. So that pull request, which has been living for a couple of days, doesn't have that much code at the end of the day. So you might be very quick to, you know, to detect an error, to find the code linked to that error, and potentially to fix the error that had been raised by that code, right? Think about it, really. It's so much harder to diagnose two months of code rather than two days of code. So we, for some, some people sometimes think we're taking some risk deploying that quickly, but that risk is not that big at the end of the day because we have a close eye on what's going on in the production system right after the deployment by the person who actually wrote the code, so they are more likely to understand what's going on. And on top of that, we have a very small work unit. It's so much easier that way, so much easier. Um, in case of problem, Ubot is going to help us too. So Ubot is listening to all the alerts, mentioning them in Slack whenever there's a problem. Um, and if there is a server problem, Ubot is going to create a ticket for us. Ubot is going to create an issue with the given error. And think about it, when you're diagnosing some error, like say CPU, like uh, CPU time uh, going over a threshold or on your production system, that happens sometimes, and you remember from the last time what you did to diagnose that. So you reapply the same technique. And every time it's going to happen, you're going to reapply the same technique. So at GitHub, we think that reapplying the same technique is a waste of time. If we know already the technique and we're going to reapply them, reapply that, then Ubot should do that for us. We can script that. We can ask Ubot to do that. So Ubot is going to create the script uh, to create the, 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 the issue, and Ubot is going to gather all the information that we usually look for when we're diagnosing a, that kind of problem. So the status of all our systems, the monitoring graphs, you know, all this information are going to be collected by Ubot and inserted in the ticket. So when I start diagnosing that information, I got all the data. And all the data is saved and stored for the next time we have to investigate that problem and see whether it was different or not. So we can learn over time about this kind of problem. 
All right, so let's say we're happy with what happened. We're merging with master. That's it. I've been, I've deployed branch. It worked in production. I merge with master, and master becomes a new version, the new known stable version of my code, basically. If there is a problem with the code I've just deployed, well, again, I get the choice to fix and redeploy quickly. Or if I don't think I can do that, I just need to redeploy master because master is a previous version before merging. Uh, master is a previous known version uh, being stable of my code. That's it. Just deploying branches all the time. Whether I'm going back or, or forward, I just deploy branches. So it's always the same process. Always. Very simple. Right? So is that cool? Like people are like, ah, yeah. Um, and, and, and very often, and I'm sure like you, the brain is working and people are start like, oh, uh, wait a minute. What about data? What about this? What about that? I mean, there are like a lot of, you know, open questions to that. So, well, I'm going to answer them. Well, first of all, I just want to go back on one thing. I told you that there is no board big enough for us to put, you know, stickers all over the planet. But there are a lot of other things we don't do. We don't have the concept of a sprint, right? Because we continuously deploy, right? Well, I mean, what is a sprint? Well, as a developer, why do I care about a sprint? Not so much. I mean, sprint have been created so we, we, we shorten the tunnel effect and we show things to uh, the business. But we, why would we care about showing things to the business every two weeks when we're deploying 80 times a day? I mean, yeah. I'm not going to slow down my process just to do a demo. Uh, so we go so much faster. We don't use Kanban also, because um, Kanban is a good way to have uh, tasks sitting somewhere, and we don't want them to sit somewhere. We want them to uh, keep flowing. We don't do Scrum, again, doing a Scrum meeting with some guy in New Zealand, a girl in Seattle, it just doesn't work. Um, so all this stuff we don't do. QA, actually we do QA. But we don't do QA as a gateway for going in production. We do QA afterwards. So the QA team is always looking at the site and try to find pockets of improvement. Uh, but it's not before the fact. The, the side benefit of that is that the developer doesn't think like, oh, I'm not sure about my code, but if there is a problem, the QA people will find it. Right? That's their job to find that stuff. So I can push crap. They will, they will filter that. We don't have that filter. If you push crap, it, it blows up. Uh, so don't push crap. That's, you don't want to be the, the person responsible for a GitHub downtime. You don't want to do that. So, <laughs> so you just push quality code. Um, there is no acceptance or, yeah, there might be acceptance, but after the fact again. Acceptance will be after it's in production, not before. And uh, we don't do release as well. I mean, there is no version 12 of GitHub that we don't have a version number. We just have a current pull request being deployed on GitHub. So all these things we don't do. Um, and if we think about it, and I love that, uh, that sentence from, from uh, uh, Antoine de saint uh, you know, perfection is achieved when there is nothing more to add. Uh, not when there is nothing more to add, but when there is nothing uh, to remove, basically. Right, so we, we tend to add, 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 but that's not thinking. You know, just adding stuff is not thinking, but removing stuff, removing what's not essential, that's what's thinking. So that's what we've been doing basically at GitHub. What's the other alternatives? Um, most of the people I talked to, they went on uh, internet when they started applying Git to their project and they typed Git workflow and they see that stuff and the, the nice blog post that goes with. I'm like, oh, okay, that must be the way of using Git, right? So we're going to do that. And so we apply a solution before defining the problem, right? Because do you really need all these branches? Do you need to do all these cherry picking, crafting a release, going back, applying patches to this branch, and that branch, and that other branch? When I looked at that for the first time, I'm like, oh, I don't understand. So if I don't understand, do I need to do that? And would my colleague will understand that? How much time are we going to have to spend over, like, are we understanding the same thing to begin with? Um, so, I mean, I, if you are playing that stuff, I encourage you to rethink whether you do need that kind of complexity or not. Um, 
and, and there is that comic strip stuff um, that I love. And the guy is, is explaining, uh, you know, all the complexity he has to go through to do a, a production release. Like, you know, at, at so many companies, you know, we did a production release, it blew up. So we said, okay, we're going to add another process so it's safer. And then we add another process so it's even safer. And then so many processes that it becomes harder and harder to go to production. So we're doing that less often and less often and less often. And it's becoming riskier at the end of the day because we don't know how to master that. We don't know how to how to obtain a um, solid outcome of that process. And so the girl is responding like, yeah, we, we debug on the live server as well because what you're doing is so complex that you have no idea what's going to happen. It's it just, you could just go there, debug in production, that would be the same outcome. Um, so I love that one. Um, so all these things, at the end of the day, we, we didn't create them. I mean, it's, it's uh, ideas that have been uh, uh, explain in, in the Phoenix project, that, that book is, is so great. Um, one way of looking at that is basically when you're using a traditional way of deploying and, and building your application, between the time you have an idea and the time it's released in production, well, you got all that time waiting. You're waiting for people to design, to create a user story, to uh, give points. You know, give estimations. I got a customer who is estimating the time he's going to take to estimate, right? Uh, you can do that if you want. Uh, but the time you spend actually working on that is just limited, right? So many people are doing two-week sprints and are deploying every three months. What's the point? I mean, yeah, you did a demo, but the value is still not in the end of the customer. You have showed to your business owner what could that feature be like, but it's still not in the end of the end user, so you still haven't brought any value to the end customer, right? It's totally useless to do two-week sprints if you're deploying every three months, because we're doing sprints to bring value quickly to the customer. So that's not what you're doing. So I would actually encourage you to deploy faster and just forget about the sprints, because they're useless at that point. Um, so if we put that in a different way, what are we doing? We're doing, uh, so we have our to-do, so we got a nice sticker with the to-do. It's moving to the work in progress column. You know, you get that Jira board with that process, right? Everybody has a Jira board with a process in it. You know, remember the Agile Manifesto? People interaction before process and tools. What was the first thing you did when you went to Agile? Install Jira, create a process, right? <laughs> <Since> <laughs> Uh, so we have the to-do, work in progress, QA, then we go for acceptance, then we have the done, because it's been done. Um, so basically, it's going back to that, right? Uh, let's do this, so it's a to-do, um, then start working on it, work in progress, then waiting for QA, then waiting for things, you know, keep waiting. That's exactly that. So, and then at the end of the day, you know, remember that Git flow stuff, you have to put patches from one branch to another and something like this. So my, uh, my Git ninja to come to do that Git stuff, that Git foo, that I just don't understand. Like at GitHub, honestly, the hardest thing you're going to do is a rebase with Git, right? We, we hardly ever do something harder than that. Um, and then we deploy months or weeks later. So, what we've been doing at GitHub basically is changing the way it works. Um, and if my animation one works. So we do the to-do, work in progress, we deploy. It's deployed. It's in the production environment. You can do your QA whenever you want. My developer is not involved anymore in that. You can do some other things. She can do some other things. Acceptance test can apply later. And when I'm saying it's done, it's not theoretically done on the test environment. It's done on the production environment. It's been, it's been using by customer. That's a real done. That's not a maybe done, right? Because as long as it's not in production, how can you dare saying it's done? It might not work. You still have no idea. Um, so then, how do we do that, right? That's the next question. So we saw the deployment process, but this requires some other things. Um, because, you know, thinking about that, you're still like, oh, I want to press the button with that code that I'm not sure about because there is not that 
you know, comfort blanket that we usually have. Uh, and if I press the button, well, my hand very badly for me. You never know. Uh, so, actually, to, to give you a sample, like I'm not just talk. I'm not just talk. I've done that, and I blew up the system. Right? That's me over there deploying to the production environment of GitHub with a couple errors. 3.5 thousand exceptions per second on GitHub.com in production environment. That's a lot of exceptions. But look at it. 11.55, it starts. 12.20, it's done. Gone. Over. Right? It's so much, you know, you have so much faster turnaround that you can afford a couple things. But at the same time, Remember, your code, whatever systems you're using or whatever process you're going through, your code is never bug-free anyway, right? But I got the opportunity in 25 minutes to fix it. What's your window of opportunity to fix a code, a, a production a bug that you have in, in your system? Might not be 25 minutes, right? It might be a lot longer. Um, so there's not so many risks over there. But, so, as a, as a quick recipe for doing that, we have a couple of frameworks. All of them are open source, um, so you can use them or another version of them because we use Ruby, uh, so our frameworks are very often for Ruby, uh, but there are declination of them. There are people who have re-implemented them in other languages, if you want. The first one we, we're using is Scientist. Scientist is a great way to have two different experiments in our production environment. So, we have the old version of the code, and we want to try the new version. So we create an experiment, and the two versions are executed at the same time. The, 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 the user sees the old version, the outcome of the old version, but we get a chance to look at our code in the production environment in a safe, uh, on, in a safe uh, sandbox, uh, let's, let's call it that way. So we know it's working, and we can capture the outcome of that code and compare it with the old version and see for like, I don't know, two days, one week, two months, doesn't matter, do I have the same data? Do I have a performance improvement? You know, what's going on over there? So, and, and it's so much, so well sandboxed that it can explode, it doesn't matter. The user will still have his, the, 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 the old uh, um, algorithm and so on. Um, the second thing we're using widely is feature flipping. So we created a framework called Flipper. Again, it's a, it's a Ruby framework, but you got version of that in so many other languages. So it's a great way for us to um, open, open up uh, access to one feature very gradually. So at, at the beginning, you know, a feature flipping is like an if in your code. So, but the control of that if is outside uh, the code. So I can say, okay, uh, I'm going to open that feature for myself as a developer. I'm going to see what it looks like. I'm the only one who can blow up something because I'm the only one who can access that. And then I'm going to share it with my team what do you think of that? And then we're going to share it uh, to the whole uh, GitHub team, the whole company. What's your feedback on that? That's where you get your opportunity for QA as well and acceptance. Yes, I mean, because uh, well, we get we get the chance to be at both uh, the developers and the users, right? We're using we're developing tools for developers, so um, and we are developers, uh, but we can give like very good feedback on on how to use that feature. Is is that great or not? Um, so that's our QA, basically, and that's where we do acceptance. Um, the other thing we're doing, I mean, because I get a lot of uh, questions for about the data, the data model, what's going on when you're changing the, the table, the schema, whatever. So we created a tool for MySQL to do online progressive migration of the data model. So with that, we can say, okay, this is our tables right now. We want to have a totally different schema with new tables, new columns, new reference, new keys, new whatever you want. Um, and we, we need to do that migration without downtime and without impacting the performance of our system. So Ghost uh, does just that. We create a progressive migration to the new schema. It creates a new set of tables that, that are filling up with data. And at one point, you know, if you give it enough time, um, you will have the same data, but in a different format, in the old schema and the new schema. With that, you can experiment. You can create some new code that are using the new schema while the users are still using the old schema. And you can wrap that with a toggle. 
with Ghost flipping, you know, saying, okay, I'm ready to you know, switch to the new schema, it's a couple milliseconds uh, lock. So a couple millisecond transaction, because when we're ready, we're just renaming the tables. That's it. You know, that's, that's, we're not moving millions of data. We're just renaming table. So I can put that in a flip and, and do that live. You know, while users are, are on my system, they will just see a couple millisecond downtime, or slow time, and that's it. So I can, I can combine all this free framework to do whatever I want and to have full flexibility on what I'm putting in front of my customer when I want to put that in front of my customer. It's not a production event to show a new feature to my customer. It's just a toggle flip, and that's it. And then we're happy, and we can hug our U-Bot. All right, um, there won't be any questions because we don't have time, but I'll be around, so you know, just grab me, and uh, we have stickers. All right, thank you.